she has a working experience of 15 years in hospital and she is also the member of uh, trainers association of india and catholic nurse guild of india so uh, thank you so much for presenting with us and today we have one more um, uh, guest speaker, uh, Ma'am Langjam Kamala Devi Ma'am. Ma'am is working as a lecturer, College of Nursing in Nigrim, Silong, Meghala itself. Ma'am has done a BSc Nursing from Sri Narayan College of uh, College from Nellore in the year 2011 and has done a uh, Master's in Nursing in the field of OBG from the Bolini College of Nursing, Nellore in AP in the year 2015. She has a working experience of total nine. One year she has worked in uh, clinical in PIC only. She has worked and had eight years of teaching experience. During her career time, she has published uh, like eight, uh, five, five number of journal and has a number of independent research projects. Like she has a two. And she is also a member of TNI, NTI, and also the member of Society of Midwife India and Gregorius International Nursing Research and Academic Foundations. Thank you so much, Kamla Ma'am, for joining with us. So I think this is a brief introduction of our guest speaker and then speaker. So now we will start our today's sessions. Okay. I think screen is visible. Munisha, your screen is visible? Yes, yes. Okay, so now I'll hand over the platform to our presenter, Sister Verity. Over to you, sis. I can speak. Yes. Okay, good afternoon to everyone present here in this uh, class for today. Uh, I'm Verity Anjirwa, as uh, Ma'am Nanuka has already introduced. Uh, and I would also like to welcome our guest speaker, Madam Longjam Devi, the lecturer from College of Nursing Negrims. And also, uh, once again, I welcome Ma'am Nanuka and all of you participants who will be listening to the class of today. So the, today's topic is all about history taking, physical examination, vital signs, and pulse oximetry. And uh, uh, the topic of today is a very lengthy topic. It, 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 uh, if, I have to go, if I have to go in detail, about the topic, it'll take more than two and a half hours. So I have briefed the topic in such a way that I have touched only the main areas and the main points, okay? So I'll be starting with the topic on history taking. So what is history taking? It is the process where you acquire information from the patient with the aim of the doctor to formulate a diagnosis and the nurses to give care to the patient accordingly. So definition is the process of acquiring information from the patient with the aim of formulating a diagnosis and providing medical care to the patient. The next part, what are the aims? The first aim is to get an overall health symptoms of the patient and it also gives us a key factor to get an accurate diagnosis of the patient. So it helps us learn about a patient's overall health symptoms and concerns. It is a key factor in timely and accurate diagnosis of acute illness, which leads to improved outcomes. The next part, what are the steps in history taking? As we have already learned during our student period, we, pract we have been practicing this uh, history taking and uh, physical examination. So let us just have a Ref uh, let us just refresh our mind again on what the steps to be followed. First, you, you get the name of the patient, age, sex, bed number, address, date of admission, date of discharge, or date of uh, surgery, date of discharge, then the informant's name. In case of pediatric, 
It is usually the parents or the significant relatives who gives the details of the patient. And the, you have the provisional diagnosis. That means provisional diagnosis means a doctor is not 100% sure of the diagnosis of the patient, but more information is required to, to be collected from the patient. Okay, so that is a provisional diagnosis. Then the final diagnosis also is uh, mentioned and the date of assessment. For example, if uh, today the 22nd is the date of, for assessment of the patient. The first step, okay, then the, uh, I mean, the first step is the, you have the collection, the data collection. The second one is the chief complaints. What do you, what do you collect for in the chief complaints? Here, the, in the chief complaints, the, the complaints of the patient should be, record, should be recorded according to the parents or the significant relatives' own words. For example, a child comes to the ward, gets admitted to the, to the ward, and the, the, uh, the doctor or the nurse uh, asks the patient, a patient's parent, what is wrong with the patient? Why have you brought the patient to the hospital? So the mother or the father will, will tell the doctor, the patient, the child had fever since two days, seizure, two episodes. So the same words of the, the parent should be documented accordingly, as have been told by the parent. And what made, you, what made the family members to bring the child to the hospital? Then the second point is history of present complaints or history of present illness. In this, uh, in this point, what you're supposed to collect is the concise chronological documentation of patient's illness with previous treatment. For example, you ask the patient about the, or you ask the mother or the parents about the onset of the illness, about the duration, how long. Onset means when, was, when did the fever start, then duration for how, since how many days, then if the child also had seizure, what is the frequency of seizure and what is the severity? Okay, so that comes under the history of present illness. You have the onset, duration, frequency, and severity. Coming to the past history, what do you look for in the past history? Here in the past history, we look for the, we ask for the major medical or surgical illness of the child, then any trauma, any previous hospitalization of the child, any or is the child or was the child on any medication, then any presence of allergies towards any drugs or any food. Okay, that comes under the past history. Then coming to the next history, that is the birth history. In the birth history, it is divided into antenatal, intranatal, newborn and postnatal history. Okay, so we have the birth history, for, uh, the antenatal history first. In the antenatal history, the mother's health, uh, health status during pregnancy is asked. Okay, then the antenatal visits, any disease condition during pregnancy, then what any infections she had during pregnancy, any exposure to any kind of drugs, exposure to radiation, did the mother receive TT doses, complete doses of TT? Okay, that comes under the antenatal history. Then comes the second part is the intranatal history. In the intranatal history, we ask about the delivery, the delivery of the child. Was it a hospital delivery, a home delivery? If it was a hospital delivery, was it a cesarean section or a normal delivery? Was there use of forceps? What was the duration of labor and any injury to the child at birth? That comes under the intranatal history. Now coming to newborn and postnatal uh, history, we ask about the newborn means the child. Okay, when the, the, about the patient, the patient who, who was admitted, what was the newborn history of the child? Was, the child? was there an immediate cry at birth in the child? Was there any resuscitative procedure done on the child? Then what about the sucking? Was the what is the, what what about the uh, was the child breastfed immediately after birth? Okay, then the feeding pattern of the child was the child able to breastfeed? Then the elimination of uh, elimination pattern of the child, that is the bowel and the uh, bowel and the bladder pattern of the child. Okay, then about the Apgar scoring, 
the appearance, pulse, grimace, activity, and respiration of the child. Okay, and the length of stay at birth. When the child was uh, was delivered, was the length of stay in the hospital a long, a lo uh, many days, or was the child uh, discharged just uh, just uh, days before, uh, after delivery? So that comes under the uh, newborn and postnatal history. Coming to the development history. In the development history, age at which milestones were achieved. We ask about the age at which milestones were achieved. Milestones means uh, at three months of age, uh, a, a baby is expected to be socializing. Okay, socializing by smiling. Okay, and then uh, the, uh, the baby is uh, ex expected to be lifting the having head holding. Okay. And then, then at, uh, then at uh, six to eight weeks, the child is able to raise the head at 45 degree. At six to eight months, the child is expected to sit without support. At eight to nine months, the child is expected to be crawling. So that is the developmental history we look for in the child or which, are all, which is also called milestones. Okay, then the school, what is the, if, if the child has started going to school, what is the present grade of the child? Then is there any specific problem in the child, like learning disability in the child, okay? And the disinterest in the child, those are the specific problems the child may have. Then what is the interaction with the other peer group in school or, uh, or with even at home, okay? That is comes under the developmental history. Then coming to the next part, that is the growth and development history. I hope you're clear with the whatever we have discussed. Then the growth and development history. When you talk about growth, it is all about the process of increase in size, okay? I repeat, growth is, a, is all about the process of increasing in size, okay? And development, in the development, it is the physical and psychological maturation. The physical and the psychological maturation. Okay, now we come first to the growth. We talk about the growth that is the increase in size. When you talk about the growth that is the physical growth, we, we talk about the age of the child. According to the age, we talk about the birth, six, uh, the, uh, the age, the weight, length, and the head circumference. These all all show an increase in the size of the child. For example, at birth, the normal, uh, the normal weight is 2.5 to 3 kgs. Then the normal length, expected length is 50 centimeters and the normal head circumference is, is uh, 34 centimeters. Then at six months, it doubles, the weight doubles. Okay, at one year, the weight triples. Okay, and so on and so forth. So when you talk about growth, it's all about the physical growth. We talk about the weight, length, and head circumference. That's all about the physical growth or the growth. Okay, now when we talk about the, then comes the dentition. Dentition is the tooth eruption. Okay, so the expected uh, age of tooth eruption is at six to 10, uh, to 10 months. Which in which we see the lower incisors, okay, growth of the uh, eruption of the lower incisors at six to ten months, and then which is followed by the central upper incisor that is eight to twelve months, okay, and these are called the temporary tooth. Then we come to the vital signs. We will be discussing it later. We move on to the development part. That is the physical and psychological maturation. Okay, physical and psychological maturation. Here, the first point under development is gross development. As you see in the, the right side of the screen, the picture, gross motor development, it talks about the, the gross motor development. It talks about the ability of the child to crawl, the ability of the child to sit, to run, and to walk. Okay? I'll just read out some of the uh, points out there on the screen. On the, on the right side of the screen, the top side, by three to four months, the child is able to raise head and chest while lying on stomach. 
Okay, by six months, rolls over both ways. By eight to nine months, can sit without support and begin to crawl. By eight to 10 months, pull to standing. By 11 to 12 months, can stand. And by 12 to 18 months, take uh, first steps or takes few steps. Okay, that comes under the gross motor development, which talks about the ability to crawl, ability to sit and walk. Okay, then we move on to the next point, fine motor development. In fine motor, you look at the cornermost picture on your right side of the screen, fine motor, what does it talk about? When you look at the picture, the child is working with the hands. Okay, it is a coordination of small muscles in movement with eyes, as you can see there, the child is moving the hands to get along with the eyes, okay, and fingers. It is the coordination of small muscles in movement with eyes, hands, and fingers. It helps in growth of intelligence. So this picture talks about the fine motor use, usage of fingers, usage of hands, along with the eyes, and along with the concentration. Okay, the child concentrates and builds those blocks. That that talks about the fine motor. Then we come to the next point that is the social development and sensory. That is the, when you look at this picture here on your, uh, on the center, that is the left side. When you talk about the social and development sensory, it is the ability of the child to interact with the others. Okay, that talks about the uh, social development and sensory. And then where uh, social, uh, social development, it, uh, at six weeks, the, uh, you expect the child to be smiling responsively. When you smile at the child, at a six-week six week old child, a baby, you expect that child to smile back at you. Okay. If it, if, uh, to smile back at the mother, at least, not at us. The, chil the children, uh, the babies will never smile back at us because they would always cry when they see us. No, it, at, at least when you, you, when you observe, the child should be smiling back at the parents, at the uh, significant relative. Okay. Then at 10 to 12 weeks, the child, you expect the child to be waving bye-bye. Okay. That is all about the social development. Then the sensory. Sensory, it relates to, uh, to our senses. That is usage, the use of vision, the use of hearing, touch, smell, and taste. Okay, that is sensory, which because uh, these uh, vision, hearing, uh, touch and smell, it allows the child to explore the world. Okay, so that is com that comes under development. The next point is dietary history. What do you what do you ask for or what do you look for in dietary history? In dietary history, you ask the mother about the breastfeeding of the child. Then weaning, when was weaning started, at which age, what was started, then modes of feeding, was the child uh, bottle fed or the child had any allergy to any food items. Then immunization, was the child, was the child immunized according to the uh, schedule applied, okay? Was the child, uh, uh, does the mother take the child uh, regularly for immunization or not? Then personal history, what is the sleep pattern of the child? Okay, toilet training, at which age the child uh, achieved toilet training? The, the normal age is usually two to two and a half years of where a child uh, achieves uh, toilet training. Okay, then elimination pattern of the child, is the elimination pattern of the child regular? Then play, is the child playful? Does the child, uh, uh, is, is the child able to, um, to uh, enjoy that play? Okay. Then school performance. What is the performance of the school in uh, of the of the child in the school? Then we come to the next. Uh, that is socioeconomic status. In socioeconomic status, here we talk about the the income of the family, the annual income of the family. Then the education of the 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 education of the child, and then the literacy of the parents. Are the parents uh, literate or illiterate? Because if the if the parents are literate, it becomes more easy for uh, us in the hospital or in, to deal to deal and to explain with the uh, with the um, to explain about the child. Okay, 
but then if the child is uh, is lit uh, if the parents are illiterate it becomes a little difficult to communicate then <clears throat> we come to the family history that is the how do i go back how do i go back <laughs> Coming to the last point of the history collection, we come to the family history, where in the family history, we ask about any congenital abnormal abnormalities in the family, presence of any uh, uh, heart disease, any uh, presence of any uh, uh, genetic disorders in the family. Then we also ask about the uh, health status of the whole family. Okay. So that comes uh, that comes to the end of the history taking. Then we will go move on to the next part, and that is physical examination. So what is physical examination? As everyone is familiar with, with the term physical examination, physical examination is the process of evaluating objective anatomic findings through the use of observation palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Then physical examination is done by inspection, percussion, palpation, and auscultation. Purposes. The first purpose is to identify the actual and potential problem. Okay, to identify the actual and the potential problem of the patient. What is actual problem? When you talk about the actual problem, it means the problem which is present at the time of your assessment in the child okay that is the actual which is present during your assessment of the child then the potential is the possible or uh, uh, problem which may arise later okay that is the potential it is a possible problem which may arise later okay that is the first purpose to identify the actual and the potential problem then to evaluate nursing care. Okay, those are the two uh, purposes. Then we come to the general principles. The, in pediatrics, uh, it is very, very much different from the adult. When you have to work with children, you have to have uh, the rapport which we are, we are to develop with the child has to be has to be very professional because dealing with children is not very easy getting their cooperation getting their uh, 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 what to say getting their cooperation and then uh, getting them to be working with you is uh, very very difficult okay so we have some general principles which are different from the adults okay so the first principle is develop rapport with the child from the first meeting from the first meeting of the uh, itself, we should be able to develop a rapport with the child, which is not always easy. Then gentling, gentle handling of the child. The child should be handled very gently. Uh, 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 voice should be, our tone, our tone of, uh, should be very gentle, okay, while dealing with the child. Then the explanation of the procedure to, to the family members. So before doing any procedure, we should always inform the family members, be it the mother or the father who is present with the child. Then the order of examination, it should be from least distressing, that means least painful, to the most distressing examination, uh, painful area last. First, it should be from the least, then to the most painful area. Be honest if something is go going to hurt, tell them in a calm manner. If you have to uh, collect a sample from the child, if it's, uh, if, it's a, if it's a preschool child, a schooler child, then they are able to understand, right? So you should always inform them and let them know that it will hurt. It will, the needle will prick and it'll hurt only for some time, okay? Then parents' lab may be preferable than examination table. Some children may, because the uh, hospital is uh, not, uh, not a friendly place for children, okay? Seeing uh, nurses in white itself, they, they, they start, uh, I mean, they begin to cry. 
Yes. So if they prefer to be on the on the parents' lap, you should always allow them to do so. Okay. Then we come to the vital signs. Okay. Then first step is the vital signs where you the steps which are involved when you start a physical examination. What is vital signs? Vital signs also is also referred to as cardinal signs, which reflect the body's physiologic status, which include temperature, pulse rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. So uh, the physiologic uh, status means the state of the body. What is the state of the body? The vital signs helps to reflect okay, the condition of the body. Then purposes. What are the purposes? To obtain a baseline data about the patient's condition for diagnostic purpose and for therapeutic purpose. Then these are some of the pediatric uh, vital signs normal ranges for different age groups that is newborn, infant, toddler, preschooler, school age and adolescent. Here we have the parameters, the respiratory rate, heart rate and the systolic blood pressure. We also have the weight in kgs. So these are some of the pediatric vital normal vital signs normal ranges. Then what are the correct sites for checking vital signs? First, I will be discussing only the main, uh, the, the most common site, okay? Checking temperature, there are many sites, but I will be dis discussing only one uh, site that is the axilla, which is most, most commonly uh, practice uh, these days. Okay, how do you place a thermometer when you have to check a temperature in the axilla? The thermometer should be placed right in the center of the axilla and it should be supported. If the if for a child, uh, support is always needed by the mother or by our, by us. Okay, during the uh, during checking checking of temperature, where you will get an accurate reading. Then. The second one is checking for respiration. How do you how do you check for the respiration? You check on exhalation, inhalation and exhalation, and that is when the chest expands and when the chest contracts. That is for one full minute. Then checking for blood pressure. When you check a blood pressure for a child, it uh, the the uh, the cuffs differ in size. Okay. So the cuff should be according to the size of the child. Okay, you have to assess the child's arm circumference. First, you get the midpoint between the shoulder and the elbow. That is, you get the midpoint of the acromion process and the olecranon process. Take the midpoint of both and that is the area where you tie the cuff. Okay, and one point you have to remember is the cuff, uh, the the size of the cuff should be two third, two third of the of, of the child's arm. Okay, the size of the cuff should be two third of the child's arm. Okay, and then the the cuff should cover two third of the child's arm, and it should the cuff bladder length should cover eighty percent to hundred percent of the circumference of the arm. That is how you will get a proper and a uh, correct reading of the blood pressure of the child. Then, what are the errors we usually uh, come across while checking vital signs? First, the first error is the incorrect cuff size and location. Sometimes for a bigger child, for a child who's 15 years of age, we, we sometimes use a smaller one, which gives a, an incorrect reading of the, of the uh, blood pressure. Then incorrect positioning. Incorrect positioning means the incorrect positioning of the cuff of the uh, while tying the cuff. Okay. Then the incorrect waveform. When you uh, when you uh, when we check the um, vital signs uh, using the monitor, the uh, the waveform which comes in the monitor. Okay. The waveform which comes in a monitor should be. Uh, checked properly. Okay, as soon as we place the the saturation probe, as soon as we place, we shouldn't we shouldn't be removing it there and then. Okay, 
As soon as the reading comes, we remove it away. We have to wait till the correct waveform comes. And the waveforms should be evenly spaced. When you, you check for the waveforms, okay, in the monitor, it should be evenly spaced e with equally uh, wide waves of equal amplitude. Okay, that is how you check for the waveform, the correct waveform. Then the incorrect temperature method. Incorrect temperature method means while uh, placing the thermometer in the axilla, the uh, placing it in a in an incorrect manner, the the tip of the thermometer is it, it instead of touching the uh, center of the axilla, it goes off to the other side. Okay, it goes off to the outside. Then respiratory rate. In the respiratory rate, we uh, while checking the for the respiratory rate, it should be checked for one full minute. Okay, we look for the inspiration and the expiration. Okay, and uh, one more thing, while checking the um, pulse of the child, the pulse of the patient, the thumb should never be used. Okay, the thumb should never be used because it, it has a, an artery there. Okay, it gives a wrong reading. So those are the five vital signs, uh, vital sign errors to avoid while checking vital signs. Then, what are the basic guidelines for measuring vital signs? The nurse caring for the client is responsible for vital sign assessment, okay? Vital signs is very much of a, a nurse's a, a responsibility. So we should be very careful and uh, uh, alert while doing vital signs. Then equipment should be functional. Before checking vital signs, we should make sure that the equipment, whichever equipment we use should be, should be functional and appropriate for the size and age of the child. Then know the client's usual range of vital signs. While checking vital signs, we should, we should, uh, we should be aware about the patient first. Okay, whether the patient is, uh, the child is uh, uh, of, the, of the higher side of uh, blood pressure or the lower side of blood pressure. Okay, whether the child is, uh, the child's uh, temperature has been on the higher side for many days. Okay, that is the uh, range of uh, vital signs of the child. Then know the complete history of the patient and control and minimize environmental factors which may affect patient's vital signs. The next part is the pulse oximetry. Okay. In pulse oximetry, it is a non-invasive monitor that measures oxygen saturation in the blood by shining light at specific wavelength through tissues, most commonly finger bed or fingernail bed. So this is a the this is a monitor which is used to check the oxygen saturation. As uh, most of us like we we practice it every day, so it is very much familiar to us. A pulse oximeter measures two things. First, it measures your heartbeat in beats per minute. Second, it measures the saturation, the, uh, the amount of oxygen in your blood, okay? So a pulse ox oximeter measures the pulse and it measures the oxygen saturation level. How do you use a pulse oximeter, okay? How do we use it? First, remove any nail polish, false nails or warm, or, and, warm your, or, and warm your hand if cold. Nail polish and false nails will not apply in pediatrics. So the, the most, uh, a common uh, patients we get with cold extremities, okay? We usually warm them up first, then we recheck the uh, saturation again. Then rest for at least five minutes before taking the measurement. Then place the oximeter on the middle or index finger. On the, the best placement is on the middle, middle or index finger. Then rest your hand on your chest at heart level and hold it still. Keep the oximeter in place for at least a minute or longer if the reading is not stable. So you can make out from the, when you look at the right side of the screen, that picture there of the saturation probe, you have to wait for the, these are the waveforms. These are the waveforms which I was talking about. Okay, you'll have to wait for at least five seconds for the waveforms to get stable. Record the highest result once it has not changed for five seconds. If for five seconds the reading is uh, remains constant, you can record the result. Then 
What is the principle of a pulse oximeter? The pulse oximeter uses a light sensor containing two sources of light, that is red and infrared, infrared light. Okay, what are the two sources of light which the pulse oximeter uses? You have the red and the infrared light. These two lights are absorbed by hemoglobin and transmitted through tissues to a photo detector. Okay, and the amount and type of light detected is converted to a digital value representing the percentage of, of hemoglobin saturated with oxygen. So we'll have a look at the picture on your right side of the screen. Here, how does it work? As soon as you place the uh, saturation probe into the, into the uh, patient's uh, uh, finger, okay, you will see these two lights coming out, infrared and red light. What do they do? They get absorbed, they are transmitted to the tissues, okay? They are transmitted through the tissues. Then there is a photo detector beneath there, which converts it into percentage, the percentage of oxygen which is present in your body. You got that? Then factors that affect pulse ox oximeter reading. What are the factors? The first one is having cold extremities. Usually, usually in, uh, when a child comes to the ward with uh, dehydration, with uh, AGE in shock, the child is usually cold. So it is quite difficult to, uh, to get the um, reading when while we check uh, the, uh, we, we, we use the pulse oximeter. Okay, so we warm up the child first and then recheck the uh, saturation of the child. Then moving while taking the reading. Okay, when, when the child is moving too much, so that the reading is, uh, the, the monitor is, uh, is not able to record the reading. Wearing nail polish, then ha having artificial nails and having thicker than normal nails. These are the factors which affect pulse oximeter reading. Coming to the next assessment is the anthropometric assessment. So in anthropometric assessment, we have the first part is the head circumference. Okay, you will, you will be seeing only pictures here. The head circumference. Okay, how do you measure head circumference? You place the tape, okay, the measurement tape over the highest, uh, uh, over the prominence of the occipital region. Then you, you round it over the forehead just above the eyebrows, okay? And there you, you will get the uh, measurement of the head or the head circumference, okay? Then the normal is usually 34, 35 centimeters in newborn, okay? So why do we, uh, why do we check for head circumference? Head circumference is mainly, uh, mainly assessed for uh, presence of uh, hydrocephalus, presence of uh, microcephaly or small head microcephaly. Okay, that is why what why we assess for the head circumference. Then coming to the next part, that is weight. How do uh, this is called the digital weighing machine, where uh, newborns to uh, to infants are weighed in this weighing machine, the digital weighing machine. Okay, so at birth, the normal weight is 2.5 to 3 kgs, where in, at six months, they double and at one year, they triple. Okay, this is how the child is placed. And when a child is uh, uh, weight, being weighed to get an accurate reading, so uh, the uh, uh, thick, heavy clothes should be removed from the child. And the best reading is uh, if, on the, if all the clothes are removed. Okay, then... The second, uh, I mean, the next weighing machine is for uh, children who are able to stand on their own. This is the other weighing machine because uh, in pediatric, they are, uh, we have different age groups. Okay. Now coming to the length, length, length in infants, uh, in newborns and infants. Okay. How they check the length and uh, the mm, here, what they do is the, the name of the, the equipment is uh, infantometer. 
Okay, the name of this equipment where they check the length of newborns and infants, it's, it's called an infantometer. Then how do you uh, check the length in the infantometer? You place the child, the child's head and, and the child's uh, uh, foot and should be touching the, the directly on the scale of the of the infantometer, as you see there in the picture. Okay, the the child's extremities should be straightened. Okay, and it should touch the the complete foot end of the infantometer to get an accurate reading of the length of the child. And the normal uh, length of the child and new of a newborn is uh, around fifty centimeter. Then coming to the stadiometer for children who are able to stand on their own, it is called a stadiometer. Okay, this is how they how the length is uh, the height is checked, not the length. The height is checked. The child's uh, the child's uh, heel should touch the the cornermost of the stadiometer. Also, the back of the body, the whole back should touch till the head. Okay, and that is how we get the accurate uh, reading of the height of the child. Then we move on to the next, that is the chest circumference. <clears throat> In the chest circumference, the placement of the tape is just above the nipples of the child. Round, we have to round the back and the tape should be placed above the nipple of the child and there you get the uh, chest circumference of the child. And in a newborn, the chest circumference is two centimeters less than the head circumference. So if the head circumference is uh, 35, the chest circumference will be 33 centimeters. And at two years, chest and uh, chest becomes larger than the head. Then coming to the mid arm circumference. In mid-arm circumference, <clears throat> it indicates the degree of malnutrition, okay? The degree of malnutrition. This uh, 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 mid-arm circumference assessment is assessed at uh, one year to five, year of, five years of age. And uh, if it is less than 12.5 centimeters, it may indicate malnutrition, and if it uh, the normal is uh, thirteen point uh, five centimeters. Okay, so that is the uh, all about the mid arm circumference where you place the tape. The tape should be placed midpoint between the acromion process and the olecranon process. That is the elbow, uh, the shoulder and the elbow. Midpoint between the shoulder and the elbow. That is the point where you assess, where you check for the mid-arm circumference. Then the next is the, <clears throat> the next is the skin fold thickness. As you can see here in this picture, skin fold thickness is the assessment of the estimation of body fat in the child using calipers. This is an instrument which is used to assess for the skin fold thickness. Okay, and the areas where uh, the assessment is done is on the triceps, that is on the upper arm, then the thigh, that is on the quadri quadriceps, then the flank or flank, which is situated uh, at the back of the, uh, between the rib and the hip. Okay, so the assessment for uh, skin fold thickness is on the triceps, on the quadri quadriceps, on the flank, which is, at the back between the hip and the rib. Okay, so that is all about the anthropometric assessment. Now, coming to the next assessment, that is the general appearance. Okay, when a child is admitted to the ward, you, you assess for the general appearance. What do you look for? You look for the activity of the child. Is the child inactive or is the child active? Okay. What is the posture of the child? Is the child having a closed posture or, a, or an open posture? Okay. Then hygiene. Is the child uh, child's hygiene being maintained or not? Okay. Then behavior of the child. In, in, <clears throat> in behavior of the child, uh, is the child able to uh, behaving uh, according to the, uh, to the age or not? Okay. Then facial expression. 
facial expression if the child is in pain you will be able to make out the facial expression of the child okay then level of consciousness is the child conscious uh, or or uh, not uh, or unconscious is the child act uh, alert okay that is the general appearance we look for activity posture hygiene behavior facial expression and level of consciousness now coming to the skin in skin we look for the color of the skin okay is the child having a normal pink color of the skin or cyanosed okay pale okay presence of pallor then temperature okay when you feel when you by touch itself you can feel that the child is having temperature or the child is uh, is cold okay then uh, we come to moisture the presence of uh, moisture in the in the, over the skin of the child okay then skin turgor skin turgor we we commonly assess during dehydration okay uh, so how do you how do we assess for dehydration we we pinch the skin over the back of the hand or the abdomen or front chest under the or under the collarbone okay if the skin recoils back that means the it is normal there is no sign of dehydration but if the skin takes time to 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 coil to recoil back that means the child is having a having a signs of dehydration that is about the skin turgor then coming to the skin lesions or skin breakdown is there any uh, lesions or uh, over the skin any history of fall okay or any uh, presence of bed sore in the child okay so that is all we assess about the skin and the general appearance now coming to the limb nodes okay in limb nodes these are the areas where you assess for limb nodes in the child okay you have the po um, pre auricular then post auricular occipital superficial cervical posterior cervical supra cervical submental then submaxillary tonsilla anterior cervical these are the areas where we assess for limb nodes okay then then uh, here is a picture of a child with a uh, swollen limb node it could be a swollen limb node it could be due to a viral or a bacterial infection then the most common sites are the neck axilla and inguinal region then the next assessment hair what do you look for in hair in hair we look for the color of the hair the distribution of uh, of the of the hair all over the head then presence of gray hair which may be due to decreased of melanin then hair loss which may be uh, due to a deficiency of vitamin b12 or vitamin d okay or calcium the, those are the and in autoimmune uh, uh, diseases also we we find a lot we find patients having a lot of uh, hair loss okay so that is what we look for in hair then head in head as we have mentioned in head you uh, you check for the head circumference of the child okay then you also look for um, you look also look for the size and shape of the head of the child the pres the fontanelles the the closure of fon fontanelles okay then head holding in the child if a child is uh, expected to at 3 months 3 4 to 4 months the child is expected to be having head holding at 45 degree angle uh there you check for the uh, head holding in the child okay then the face what do you look for in the face in the face we look for the facial expression in the child the symmetry of the face okay symmetry of the face as you can see here in this picture the 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 face of the child is not symmetrical okay then we look for any presence of paralysis in the face of the child okay that is what we look for in the face then the eyes eyes we look for as you can see in the picture here presence of orbital edema presence of any eye discharge okay presence of squint mongolian's land okay then you also look for uh, in uh, edema periorbital edema is most commonly seen in patients with uh, nephrotic syndrome okay 
Then coming to the next assessment, that is the ears. In the ears, we look for eye discharge, then signs of pain in the child. When a child is having pain in the ears, you will always find, you will commonly find the child rubbing the ears. Okay, rubbing the ears. And uh, you, you can also assess for hearing disabilities in the child. Then the nose. In the nose, <clears throat> what do you look for? In the nose, we look for any presence of a nasal flaring, uh, nasal flaring, which is the movement of the nostrils that is mostly seen in respiratory distress, uh, in a respiratory distress child. Then we also look for any uh, you know, bleeding in the child, nose bleeding, and then a deviated nasal septum, okay? And a nose, uh, nose block in the child. Okay, then mouth and throat. In mouth and throat, you, you look for the color of lips, gum bleeding, uh, presence of any cleft lip, cleft palate, then coated tongue in the child, as you can see in this picture. Okay, then presence of uh, 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 what a uh, source in the uh, tonsils of the child, and then presence of tongue tie in the child. Okay, this last picture is a picture of a child having a tongue tie. We as nurses can uh, and are able to identify all these abnormalities in the child during our daily uh, nursing care of our patients. Then coming to the next examination that or assessment that is the respiratory assessment. In the respiratory assessment, first is we inspect, okay, we look for. What do we inspect for? We we'll inspect for the shape of the chest of the child, whether the child has a bulging chest, then the presence of retractions, then we look for the rate and the rhythm of the uh, respiration, okay? Then the symmetry of the chest during expansion. When the child is breathing in and out, we look for the symmetry of the chest. Then the use of accessory muscles. Accessory muscles, if the child is breathing using the accessory muscles, that means the child is having a distress. Okay. Then what, what all do we look for? The noises. The noises. The common noises are strider, which is a high pitch noise. Okay. When the larynx is obstructed. Okay. Then wheeze. Wheeze is a high pitch noise during expiration when the child is exp uh, having expiration then there is the that is the sound of the wheeze then cough in cough you assess for wet cough that is productive cough okay dry cough paroxysmal cough paroxysmal cough is an uncontrolled cough okay that is paroxysmal cough and then you also assess for grunting Grunting, which is a short, deep sound. Okay, this is uh, mostly mm, seen in uh, in uh, newborns with uh, meconium asp uh, meconium aspiration syndrome. Okay, grunting sound that is a short, deep sound. Then, then you assess for the cry in the child. What what uh, what what type of cry is it? Is it a normal cry or is it a high pitch cry? Okay, or an irritable cry in the child. Okay, then. Coming to the next assessment of respiratory uh, system, that is the work of breathing. When you talk about work of breathing, you talk about the rate of respiration. When you check for the rate of respiration, you will be able to make out whether the child is having tachypnea or high respiratory rate or bradypnea, which is a decreased respiratory rate. Then head bobbing. Head bobbing is when the child is in distress, the, uh, especially in, in infants and newborns, they bob their head, that is they nod the head and trying to, uh, trying to uh, breathe in and breathe out, they nod the head, that is called head bobbing. Then retractions, in retractions, it indicates the, that the body of the child is working hard to get enough of oxygen. Okay, retraction is the indrawing of the intercostal muscles during breathing. Retractions are very common in respiratory distress. Okay, the indrawing of the intercostal muscles with each breath. Then nasal flaring, as I have mentioned, nasal flaring is the movement of the nostrils while breathing. 
Then the other assessment is use, using the pulse oximetry to be able to assess for the oxygen level. Then auscultation. In auscultation, uh, uh, the normal and the abnormal breath sounds are auscultated. Okay, so the abnormal breath sounds which can be auscultated are wheeze, strider, ronchi. Okay, those are the abnormal breath sounds which can be auscultated using the stethoscope. Coming to the uh, cardiovascular assessment. In cardiovascular assessment, The points we look for are head to foot, okay? How can you assess a child having a cardiovascular assessment? Looking at the hair, you find the hair brittle, dry, there is poor nutrition in the child, okay? Then in the eyes, there is uh, vascular changes, which may be a result of increased BP in the child. Then there is ye raised yellow-orange plaque under the eyelids, okay? Then coming to the lips and tongue, we have blue tinge, thick cyanosis. The child is dry and dehydrated. Then in the jugular vein, the, the vein is distended when the, when the child is at 45 degree angle. Then when you come to the chest, when you auscultate for the chest, there, there is presence of crackles or rails. Then the blood pressure is at, at, a, and in a, at a higher level, okay? Then in the abdomen, there is a fluid accumulation or presence of ascites. Then you also have a, a tender liver. That means a, a on, on palpation of the liver, it may indicate right-sided heart failure. Then coming to the skin, the skin is dry. It is <clears throat> cool because of poor nutrition. And there is also pallor which may suggest anemia or decreased circulation. Then coming to the sacrum, uh, we look for the uh, presence of edema, okay? Then nails, coming to the nails, we look for clubbing of the fingers due to poor oxygen, uh, poor, uh, oxygen uh, supply. Then the nails are thick, okay? Then the, we come to the lower extremities. There is absence of hair and thin skin, which are signs of poor circulation. Then coming to the legs, ankles, and feet, there is presence of edema, presence of pulses. Okay, pulses are strong here. Yeah? Then decreased sensation and pressure areas. So that is what we assess for in cardiovascular assessment. Now we move on to the abdominal examination. In abdominal examination, first is, it is related to the GI system. So the first assessment in abdominal examination, that is inspection, we look for the, we assess for the shape of the abdomen, inspection. The first picture is inspection, okay? So we assess for the shape of the abdomen, of the abdomen, presence of distension, okay? Whether the presence of distension is localized or generalized. Localized means if the distension is only over a particular area, generalized or over a, the whole area of the abdomen. Then the next point in uh, inspection of the abdomen is the you look for the umbilical shape and position. Whether the, the umbilicus is protruded or not, okay? Then we look for the engorged veins around the umbilicus, which may be due to portal presence of portal hypertension okay then we check the abdominal girth of the child okay which which may suggest a presence of ascites okay that comes under inspection we look for the shape we look for the umbilical shape and position the engorged veins and the abdominal girth coming to the next part that is abdominal palpation in abdominal palpation First thing is, as, as we uh, palpate over the abdomen, okay, we, we, should, we, should, never, we should never ask the child. We, we, we will be able to uh, identify if the child is having pain over the, that particular area through the facial expression or through the response of the child, okay? So as we palpate on, over a particular area, we, we uh, are able to identify. So the first palpation is, liver palpation. 
with the right hand, as you see here in the picture, with the right hand, we palpate the liver over the right iliac region. Okay? Palpate the liver over the right iliac region. That is how the liver, if the, the liver is uh, enlarged, the liver will be more palpable. Then we also palpate the liver for the, uh, for the, uh, for the symmetry of the liver. Then if the, it is a continuous uh, enlargement or uh, the, uh, the liver is enlarged only on one area. Then coming to the endocrine. The endocrine talks about the um, uh, talks about the thyroid, okay, the enlargement of the thyroid, where we palpate the thyroid for the enlargement. Then coming to the hemat hematological, where we uh, palpate for the spleen or the enlarged spleen, okay, and the palpation is done using the, with the right hand, the right hand is kept under the, under, uh, behind the back of the ribs, and with the left hand, the spleen is palpated over the left coastal region of the child. Okay, over the left coastal region, the spleen is palp palp palpated. Then we come to the kidney palpation. The kidney palpation is done below the coastal margin on both sides. Below the coastal margin on both sides. Okay, that is how the kidney is palpated. Then Coming to the presence of, how, we, how do we check for the presence of uh, ascites, okay, which is called the flu, uh, fluid thrill, okay. The hand is placed over the center of the abdomen and on the other side, the right hand is placed, okay, and on the left side, we give a tap over the abdomen, on the side of the abdomen, and if we feel the thrill on the opposite side, that means there is a presence of fluid in the or presence of fluid or ascites. Then we come to the next part that is the percussion. In percussion, percussion is an examination where uh, 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 one hand is placed and the, the other hand is uh, tapped over the middle finger of the hand which is placed of, over the abdomen. So in percussion, it is usually done to, uh, to percussed, uh, to, uh, to uh, elicit for ascites in the child, okay? So as you see here in the picture, in this picture, how is per uh, percussion done, okay? Then coming to the last part, that is the auscultation. In auscultation, the common uh, the the common areas which are auscultated are the uh, for the uh, peristaltic uh, sounds okay the stethoscope is placed over the periumbilical area okay and uh, if the sounds are exaggerated it may indicate the presence of intestinal obstruction okay and if there is presence of peritonitis there be, may, be there may not be any audible sounds in the uh, in the abdomen of the child. So that is all about the abdominal examination. Coming to the next examination, the genitourinary system. Okay. So in the genitourinary system, in male, what do we look for in male? In male, we look for any presence of swelling, then any inflammation, then presence of hypospadias, or epispadias. Hypospadias is the urethral opening at the inferior aspect of the, of the shaft. Okay. Hypospadias is the presence of the urethral opening at the inferior below the penis. Okay. That is hypospadias. And epispadias is the presence of uh, the presence of the urethral opening on the dorsum of the penis. Okay. On the dorsum that is over the penis that is the present that is epispadias then you also look for the presence of ambiguous genitalia which is this uh, first picture here this is the ambiguous genitalia which shows the presence of both male and female gen genitalia which is called ambiguous genitalia then the other uh, the other abnormalities you look for in male are the presence of undescended testes. Undescended testes, which is uh, commonly seen in preterms, okay, preterm babies. 
Then coming to the female, in female, what do you assess for? Okay, in female, you assess for signs of infection, abnormal discharge, foul smelling discharge, then hygiene, then diaper rashes or presence of bleeding. So that is what you look for in female genitourinary system. Coming to the anus and rectum, uh, rectal assessment, in the anus and rectal assessment, you, you look for presence of pain in the child, any bleeding, any protrusion or abscess, the, any stool abnormalities, then imporphorate anus, which means the, the anal opening is closed. Okay, so about the imporphorate anus, it can be assessed by us uh, at birth of the child itself. When the child is, uh, when the um, uh, newborn is brought to the, is uh, being assessed, the child can can be uh, uh, imperforate anus can be checked by uh, using the thermometer to, uh, to to check the rectum of the child if it is uh, open or not. Okay. Then coming to the next assessment that is the musculoskeletal system. In the musculoskeletal system, we have the back. What do you look for in the back? In the back, you look for the presence of tuft of hair. Okay, here in the second picture also, the tuft of hair is present, which may indicate presence of uh, spina bifida, then sinus, sinus, uh, sinus are the dimple-like presence on the back, okay, then presence of hemangioma, okay, then you also look for any uh, lesion, which, is, uh, which may be present, any signs of bed sore, okay, that is what you look for in the back. Then the extremities. In the upper and the lower extremities, you look for the symmetry of the extremities, okay? Then you look for the clubbing of toenails and fingernails, then presence of cyanosis, okay? Then presence of edema of both the lower and the upper extremities. That is what you look for in the extremities. Then we come to the neurological assessment. In neurological assessment, the first assessment is this first picture here, gross motor activities. That is uh, what I have told, I have mentioned before. It's all about the ability of the child to crawl, to walk, to run. Okay, that, come, that is all about gross motor activities according to the age of the child. Then the fine motor activities, that is the ability of the child to use the uh, to use the muscles of the fingers and the hands along with the coordination with the eyes. Okay, then you have posturing, posture. Okay, when a child is brought to the, maybe a child with, uh, with a fever, a child with a, a fall, okay, head injury, this is an important, uh, or a child with uh, sus, uh, sus, uh, where you we suspect you know, for meningitis, okay? The child can be assessed, the posturing can be assessed, okay? That is decorticate, decorticate where the arms are like C-shaped, okay? They, they are like C-shaped, which may be problems related with cervical spinal tract or cerebral hemisphere. Then decerebrate, that is the, that is the arms are like E-shaped. Okay, problems within midbrain or pons. So that is posturing. Decorticate, C shape, decerebrate, E shape. Then coming to the signs of uh, positivity in meningitis. We have two signs that is Koenig sign and Brodzinski sign. In Koenig sign, as you see here in the picture, the examiner uh, flexes the, uh, the leg of the child. And if there is a resistance, if there is a resistance uh, to extension of the leg while the hip is flexed, that means the it is positive to Koenig sign. Okay, so the examiner flexes the leg of the child to the hip, and if there is a resistance, the, it is a positivity of Koenig sign. Coming to the next sign, that is Brodzinski sign. Okay, if you see, you see the examiner flexes the neck of the child. On neck flexion, the response is a flexion of the hips and the knees, which is a positive uh, sign for Brodzinski's, okay? Which is a positive sign for meningeal irritation. So as the examiner lifts the, flexes the head, 
the knee and the hip automatically flexes. Okay, this is a sign of positive Brzezinski, Brzezinski sign. Are you clear? Now we move on to the next part of neurological assessment that is a pediatric Glasgow Comma Scale. This uh, GCS scale is, is uh, the same for uh, as of the adult, but the only difference is in the age group here. We have zero to three months for uh, patients who are uh, below uh, zero, to, who are between zero to three months, who are not able to verbalize and thus where, wherein the speech is not developed. So this is the uh, complete uh, separate assessment for them. Smiles, coos, cries appropriately, then cries, then inappropriate crying or screaming, grunts and no response. Then coming to the assessment of the behavior. Okay, the behavioral pattern of the child. What do you assess for here? You assess for the irrit irritability of the child, the aggressiveness, then the ability to respond, the ability to cooperate in the child. That is what we look for in the behavior pattern. Okay, so I have come to the end of today's presentation and I hope uh, all of you participants have uh, gained uh, some knowledge because the, the presentation ha has been cut uh, short in, a, in such a way that mm -hmm. I could, if, if, uh, I'm able to complete it in one hour. I hope everyone has uh, gained uh, knowledge. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vanti. Uh, now I request uh, Ma'am Kamla to uh, give your thoughts in this regard. Ma'am Kamla, you are able to unmute? Um, Bunishur, can you? Okay, I'm trying. Okay, okay yes. Thank you so much, uh, Naruka, and then Vanity, you have given me my introduction also, as well as I got the opportunity to participate along with you people. Thank you so much, and good afternoon to everybody who are present here. Sister Vanity have uh, have uh, uh, nicely she have given the session that I think there is no specific thing to add up from my side also, but still I'll just add up that. Uh, um, that when we are dealing about the child, first of all, we have to know very well about the year of the child. That is very much important because in the child, the growth and development, the growth, this motor development, the intellectual development, it's all different from one age group to another age group. So that's why we have to know that the child is below one year, or it's above the one year, it's in the toddler preschool, school, so that we have to know it very well. And same time, who is the informant? Who, who, from whom we are getting the information for the child, the historian. So that is also very much important. And same time, Sister Vanity have clearly mentioned that we need a good IPR also with the child. So we have to maintain the IPR so that the child will be able to interact. The child will be able to reveal out the things to so the child who, is, who are above five years today they, they could be able to share their feeling their problems they can share to us but below the five years children that they could not be able to express so we have to observe little bit keenly also and uh, apart from that in the history collection part which i can uh, i want to add up is uh, this immunization history we have to focus it so in the immunization history, just not to ask that, that, that whether they have immunized or not. So we have to be very specified. So what are the immunizations they have taken? What are the vaccinations they have done that we have to be uh, specific? And then after that, uh, sister have already mentioned regarding the birth history and then uh, this antenatal as well as the intranatal period history. So in that, just I want to add up that we have to collect the history of any birth injuries. So during the time of the birth 
intranatal period, any birth injuries are happen, and then whether the child has hyperbilirubinia is there or not. So these things, uh, just uh, I want to add up it. And apart from that, uh, in the physical examination, in the hair, if we are seeing that, that we have to know that the children who are having this uh, malnutrition problem, protein energy uh, malnutrition problem, say, you might have heard about the Kawasi ochre and the Madamis. In this case, the child will have brittle hair will be there. So for that, we need to focus on the hair also. And as well as when we are doing the abdominal palpation, we have to see the uh, any olive-like mass is there or not. So which indicates there is a pyloric stenosis will be there. So that things I want to add up it. And apart from that, everything it is being covered off regarding the vital signs and everything, all whatever we have discussed within this short period, uh, so we have covered up nicely. And coming to the physical examination itself, extremities, just I want to add up that, we have to see that there whether is no knee is present or not. And then same timing, we have to see in the newborns too, especially, we have to see the hip dislocation also dysplasia of the hip. So which already say have shown the picture also that folding of the thighs, that picture image have been put there. And then behavior. So if you see the behavior of the children, so in the behavior, I want to add up a point that we have to see that whether the child is having any temper tantrum is there, any habit of uh, the spike, nightmares, these things, this behavior, then thumb sucking, these things we have to observe it. So these are the some few points which I want to add up with. Apart from that, everything Sister Vanity have clearly discussed and I think, and I hope everyone have uh, understood very much clearly also. And thank you once again, Nanuka. <laughs> okay, thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Sister Vanity. I think Sister has explained very nicely and thank you, yeah. Adi. Yes. Uh, for all those important points also. Um, I request participants, those who you have any doubt, you can write down your queries in the chat box, okay, so that we can take up your questions and we try to answer your, uh, try to solve your queries. Till now, I have not um, seen any queries out in the chat box. Sorry, we are a little bit delay, uh, over the time because we have started a little late. And I also request uh, participants, so if even if you have uh, completed your pre-test, post-test, thank you. We will come to know in the link. Uh, no need to mention here, it's trouble for you also to writing. And then at the same time, especially during the presentation time, the other participant will get distracted. So I request, uh, even if you will not write here, we will come to know, okay? So that is the one thing. And I have, uh, thank you for all the responses. Thank you for cooperations. And one more thing again, I wanted to request till now we have given all the certificates. Today I have given screenshot uh, in the WhatsApp message, few of the screenshot, please see. Uh, uh, we have column uh, into three row. First one, the certificate which we have already given. And then second, those who have not registered. And third one, even if they have registered also, some people have at attended a very less time, like 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 20 minutes. So with uh, such a short period of time, if you are attending for the sessions, we are considering as an absent. So this is again, uh, uh, again, I'm giving a repeat information. Please do not change your phone number and email ID during the entire course. Use only the same one. Because whenever we are trying to analyze the, your attendance, if we are changing your email ID or phone number, then again, it will consider as a two in 